Hi everybody, welcome back to the BizTech Academy, Steve here, and today is the day after the day before, and my review of the Premier African Minerals and George Roach Q&A session that was held on the 30th of March, pending the AGM in a week's time. I've been mulling over how to deal with this particular review ever since I saw the Q&A session itself, and I've decided not to dwell on the past and look at all the terrible things that have happened with Prem over the last year or so. I'm going to try and be an objective and just look at the facts that are stated in the Q&A and see what this means for Prem's future. To that end, I'm going to start with a short recap of where I feel Premier African Minerals is prior to the Q&A session, and then I'm going to focus on the new news items that are stated and announced in that particular session. That said, that doesn't mean I'm going to ignore some of the obvious contradictions to recent communications that exist in this particular Q&A session. I shall certainly pull out a few of those as well. However, I do want to say that this video is not a witch hunt. Premier African Minerals is where it is. And what's most important is that we look at the facts that are displayed in this Q&A session in a candid way and try and understand the implications of these for the future of PREP. And at the end of this video, I will also tell you how I voted in terms of the AGM and the two specific resolutions. Okay, before I jump in, I must say as always that none of this is financial advice. I'm not a financial advisor and everything I say today is purely my opinion. And of course, if you do like this video and you want me to continue doing videos on PrEP and also continue with the BizTech channel generally, then please give it a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel. Any support you can give us is greatly appreciated. Okay, so before I go into the Q&A session itself, and as a high-level summary of where I see Premier African Minerals today, we've had a number of different RNSs and interviews over the last six weeks, and throughout these, the following have been confirmed. Production has been achieved of saleable product. First shipment is hoped to be made by March end. The minor production issues facing Zulu will take hours and days to fix, not days and weeks. Working capital funding is likely to come from traditional debt financing, with then a request to authorise the availability of up to 4.5 billion new shares for issue. The freezing of the EPO licence renewal application and a limited update on the status of the Numitari project. And the question is, did the Q&A session provide any update to all or most of these particular items? Well, for me, I think the session did. And I will also add that I think this particular Q&A session was the most transparent and honest that I've seen George Roach be since I've started following Prem. So what was actually said? Well, the session was long. It was over an hour, but it was broken down into logical sections. And I'm going to follow the sections as part of this video, barring one exception. George kicked off by talking about the status of the plant operations. He then talked about production and shipping. But I'm going to flip these two points around. The most important for me for sure, and I would guess for most people watching this video, is how much SC6 has been produced and how much has been shipped. Following production, I'll move on to cash and what cash has been spent on and what it's going to be spent on. I'll then talk about the Matari projects and I'll then move on to the status of the CAMMAX and Premier African Minerals relationship. But ultimately, I'll talk about the potential future for Prem and what George said about that. And then finally, I'll talk about George himself and his comments about his own future with Premier African Minerals. Okay, so let's start with production and shipping. As recently as the last Stockbox interview, and I think this was on the 21st of March, George stated, and I put in quotes, he was hopeful to make a shipment before the end of March. Well, in the Q&A session, George confirmed again that the plant had produced SC6, so the grades were looking good, but he also confirmed that no shipment would be made in March, and he was hopeful this time that a shipment would be made by the end of April. In fact, he also stated that if not already applied for, an export license to ship product to CAMAX in China was in the process of being applied for, and this particular license was on a three-week lead time, and therefore plenty enough time to allow for shipment by the end of April. But hang on a minute, if an export license takes three weeks to be issued, and one's not been applied for yet, then George, you would have known at least three weeks ago that you were not going to ship in March, yet we've had at least three RNSs and three interviews within that period. Now, I said this is not going to be a witch hunt, and it's not going to be a witch hunt, but it's very clear that no shipment was ever planned in March. So, George, why didn't you say that from the start? The market and shareholders don't like surprises. Please be transparent and be honest. Moreover, at the end of the Q&A session, Mark Fairbarn from Stopbox came on, and I managed to squeeze a question into him through uh, our LinkedIn relationship. And I asked that notwithstanding there being no shipment by the end of March, how much product, how many tons of SC6 have actually been produced by Premier African Minerals to date? But unfortunately, George refused point blank to answer this question. He literally went quiet and said he was not willing to answer that question, by which you can only assume that it can't be much that's been produced. 
In fact, later in this section, George did confirm that little production had been achieved by the plant so far. In fact, he said that it was very difficult to keep the plant um, on continuous production for over 24 hours. And this is against a target of 22 days per month of continuous production. And I'll come back to this point shortly. So in summary, with no definitive statement about a date for shipping and a number of tons that have been produced so far, we have no real evidence and any proof that any shipment will be made in the near future, never mind the end of April. This is something that is completely unknown at the moment, and I'll be honest with you, I find this quite unacceptable. Yes, the news about applying for an export license takes us one step further, if you like. But in truth, this is just that. It is just a statement about an application for an export license. It means nothing in terms of an actual shipment date. Okay, so that's it for production and for shipping. I'm going to move on to the plant status in a second. But before I do, I just want to add in a little spoiler alert. For me, the shipping and production part of this particular Q&A session was the worst part of it all. I think it was very negative. It didn't tell us anything, as I've already just discussed. However, I feel the rest of the actual Q&A session was relatively positive in terms of Prem looking forward. Don't get me wrong. Prem is not an operating plant at this point in time. But as I said at the beginning, I'm not going to focus on the past. I'm going to focus on what was stated in this Q&A session and try and look what this means for Prem going forward. And on the subject of the plant, George spent a lot of time talking about this. In fact, he spent quite a bit of time talking about Stark resources, and he made it very clear that Stark and Prem are very much in a dispute at the moment. In fact, Stark um, owe um, Prem, according to George, $4 million in relation to um, the large mill. But at this point in time, due to multiple reasons, Stark is refusing to pay that. Now, the legalities of the dispute between Prem and Stark are outside the scope of this particular video. And although George did spend a lot of time talking about this, he also spent a lot of time explaining in detail some of the challenges he has with the plant at the moment and what he's trying to do to overcome them. And in summary, George stated that all of the constituent parts of the plant, outside of the sorters which I'll come to, are in situ, are of good quality, and are all working in isolation. However, there are several issues with the interconnectivity of the flow of product between the constituent parts of the plant, and it's these issues that are being focused on now and being resolved one by one. But the negative thing about this is that each time an issue is found, that particular part of the plant, or even the whole plant, needs to be shut down to resolve that issue, and this disrupts the continuity of production. And it's this continuous production that needs to be improved dramatically to allow Prem to produce more product in volume. Now, George did state that he expects to make major progress in this area over next week, and this should massively improve the amount of product that's coming out uh, of the actual factory itself. But to be honest with you, we've heard these words before, so I'm not going to hold my breath on this particular one. We'll wait until we see a formal RNS stating that the volumes have increased. However, the positive thing to me is that George did go into a great deal of depth about some of these particular issues, and they did look relatively minor, although potentially large in terms of quantity. And this backs up the comment that George has said a number of times now that the issue associated with these particular problems is that they are time-based. So there is a time cost associated with them. It's not a great deal of capital expenditure. But of course, time is money. Now, as a side issue, and having been in production for many years in my previous life, uh, and regards to the dispute between Prem and um, Stark, as I said, I don't want to go into the detail of this, but I do want to say a couple of things around the question of commissioning and design and the difference between the two points. What's clearly in dispute here is that the issues that Prem are facing, or at least some of those issues, uh, Prem are deeming these as design issues. They're saying the plant is not designed for purpose and therefore changes have to occur. Where what Stark is saying is that they're commissioning issues, and if we'd been allowed to stay on site, these commission issues would have been overcome, um, and they are not therefore an issue that is in breach of the contract between Prem and Stark. Of course, I don't know any amount of the detail of the issues that the Zulu plant is facing at this point in time, but I will say that one point that George raised about the colour of the electrical wires that um, Stark has imposed, I don't particularly see this um, as a particular design issue. It might be inconvenient, it might be annoying, and it might be a pain, but I don't think that's really a design issue. However, commissioning, for example, if you consider, for example, a pump or maybe a feed pipe, would be checking whether that pump or that feed pipe is leaking once it's first turned on. What you're actually checking for is to make sure that all the fixings have been tightened correctly when it was first installed. That said, if the pump needs to be replaced because it's not powerful enough for the product going through the process, or for example, if the pipe needs to be changed to a narrower or to a wider pipe for that product to flow through the process, then that is a design issue. That pipe and that particular pump were not designed correctly for the product that was um, designated or specified for that particular plant. And Mr. Madison, if you're watching this, that is actually something that Stark was, is responsible for and needs to be rectified by Stark. Certainly in my view, anyway. 
Okay, so there was a lot of information about the issues that the plant is facing. And it was quite refreshing to see these issues. Obviously, it's annoying that these issues exist, but it's good that we're now getting to see that they're out in the open. And the fact that the Prem team are getting hold of these issues and trying to knock them down one by one. And doing this should gradually increase the continuity of production. And increasing the continuity of production or uptime for the plant, if you like, will ultimately increase output from the plant. Moreover, and in relation to the sorters, George Roach stated that they have now engaged with three different OEMs to test different sorting solutions to overcome the challenges they have currently with the XRP sorting solution. And to this end, I think personally, there is an inevitability that the XRP sorter will have to be changed. It will be removed and replaced by something that is more suitable. Now, what the cost of this is, obviously, we'll find out in due course, but I'm not sure that it will be particularly cheap. But at least options are being considered. This wasn't the case six weeks ago. When Stark were on board, Prem had their heads in the sand and they just listened and took note of everything that Stark said, which clearly was not always correct. Now what's happening is Prem are taking control and they're facing the issues head on, which has got to be positive. It's got to be a way forward. And sticking with the sorters for a second, George also confirmed the quality product is still being sorted, manually sorted, hand sorted, if you like, on the ROM pad. And this will continue up until they have a permanent solution for the sorter issue that they're facing. Another positive thing that came out was George confirmed that he's now engaging with a DMS supplier to potentially engage and receive a DMS plant, a small DMS plant, on site at Zulu on a revenue share based model to deal with product that is incorrectly sized or too small for the sorting process to manage. Now, of course, we await the conclusion of the discussions of this, but the most important thing to note for me is that, again, options are being considered. And if this does become a reality, then product that is sitting around that's earning no money whatsoever but incurring cost, or certainly having incurred cost, can now be processed and revenue can be generated that can support the ongoing cash flow for Prem. Okay, so let's move on now to cash and how cash has been spent. And to be fair, George didn't really add a great deal of detail here. He basically said that if people wanted to know what money was being spent on, it's all public knowledge, it's in various RNSs, it's in the accounts. And to be fair, it is. I've seen this myself and I understand it and I know exactly where it's coming from. He's also stated that the current expenditure will be formulated and will be accounted for in the next accounts that are going to be released, which I think will not be too far away, maybe in the next quarter. What disappointed me, however, was a question that I asked that was not answered, and that was this $800 of production cost per ton. Does this include or exclude the general administration costs needed to run the plant, uh, run Prem as a company? And this includes, for example, all the salaries of the board members, uh, the management, and so on, and so on, and so on. Um, and I personally think that this isn't the case. I think this $800 excludes that cost, and therefore this particular cost would need to be covered somewhere or other from another source. But of course, I could be wrong on this. And if I am, then George, if you're watching this, please let me know. $800 production costs. Does this cover all of the general administration costs of running Prem? So your salary, for example, or the management team's salary, contracts or salaries, board payments, uh, security, insurance, etc., etc., etc. Does that $800 cover that or not? Okay, before I move off the cost, there's a couple of positive points that did come out of the Q&A session. And these are certainly worthy of note. Firstly, and in relation to George's loan, the $1.7 million that George loaned to Prem, I think back in August of next year, George did quite rightly say that at some stage or other, Prem will need to pay that. And at this point in time, certainly from a contractual standpoint, Prem is in default by not paying it. George is also right by saying that when Prem pays this particular loan back, it's an issue for Prem and Prem's board. It's not an issue for George as an independent creditor, which is what he is by paying this loan. This is something Prem and Prem's board will need to talk about and make a statement out in due course. However, what George also said, and to be fair to him, he did say that although this money is owed to him, he's not trying to call this particular debt in at any point in time in the near future. And for me, what this said is that if this particular resolution, Resolution 2 in the AGM is passed, an authorization is given to the board to raise new shares for funding, it won't necessarily mean that immediately £1.7 million worth of shares will be raised to pay George back. Now, sticking with the share raise, the second important thing that came out of George in relation to, to cash and specific to the share raise was that he said, and he said this before, that the share raise itself, or if it's part of the AGM, raising funding through a share raise is a secondary priority. The priority is actually to get traditional debt funding. And if they start to ship, traditional debt providers, so banks, for example, have committed to Prem, and these are George's words, that debt facilities will be available to them, and that would negate the need to issue shares at this point in time. 
Now, of course, many of you, and I am one of them, I can assure you, a little bit cynical about this statement. I will wait and see what happens at the AGM, wait and see uh, what happens in terms of shipment, and wait and see what happens uh, from the banks or the, uh, the debt providers. Uh, at this point in time, I'm making an assumption, to be fair, that uh, if shares are going to be issued and there's going to be additional um, dilution, if that isn't the case, that will be massively positive and really good for the share price, I think. But again, I'm a little bit cynical with George's statement at this point in time. OK, if I now move on to the Matari project, George finally broke the news that the 50% ownership that Ally3 used to have of the Matari project has been sold to a Dubai-based company that was co-founded uh, by Sir Samuel Jonah. And little investigation shows that this company is Green African Minerals, or GAM as I'm going to call it from now on, and GAM is an African battery minerals exploration company. Now, I haven't delved deeply into GAM, but George did state that he's known Sir Samuel Jonah for many years. He's worked with him before. And at the moment, GAM and Premier African Minerals are working together to try and devise a plan and a strategy for the next stages of exploring uh, the Matari area. Moreover, George said that his preference is to list Matari on something like Amy Alternative Investment Market. And if he did this, then shareholders in Prem or current shareholders in Prem would also receive shares in this new company. Now, of course, social media is jumping on this and saying free shares and free money for everybody, which if George gets his wish, at least to some extent, is true. However, and although I don't want to downplay this positive news update, and it is a positive news update, what George Roach wants isn't necessarily what Samuel Jonah wants. Further, no one knows what the value is of the Patari project, and therefore no one knows what the amount of shares or the value of the shares the Premier African Mineral shareholders would get if this project does actually list as a separate legal entity. But I think it's also fair to say that the Matari project is probably valued at zero or completely ignored when it comes down to the Premier African Mineral share price at this time. Watch this space on this one. I wouldn't be surprised if there's not an RNS on the Matari project sometime this week. What George has stated is new news. It arguably is price sensitive and therefore it does warrant some sort of formal news item. OK, in terms of the offtake agreement at CanMax, George didn't really say a great deal here. He simply stated that he can't talk on behalf of CanMax, which of course I understand. And he also stated that if he was CanMax, he'd also be frustrated in the current situation. Now, for me, and as I just said, I understand that he can't speak on behalf of CAMAX, but it does worry me as time goes on and we don't hear anything from CAMAX. The cash payment that CAMAX can call in for missed shipments each month goes up from $1.5 million per month uh, at the end of February to $3 million per month from the end of March. Now, CAMAX hasn't called this in, but this is an option for them. What's more is the clock is ticking um, every day to a closer time, sometime in 2025, when CAMAX can take shares in the Zulu plant if Prem doesn't pay them back the full offtake and prepayment amount. In fact, when you do the numbers, it looks inevitable now that some form of Zulu shareholding will be transferred to CAMAX uh, in 2025 because it seems uh, highly likely that Premier African Minerals will not be able to pay the full prepayment agreement off uh, within that time period. This is only likely to happen if they achieve nameplate for conduction very, very soon and also if the price of SC6 dramatically rises. And remember that although CAMAX taking a percentage in Zulu is not a direct dilution in shareholders' Premier African Minerals shares per se, what it does mean is that if Premier African Minerals um, sells Zulu sometime after that particular shareholding is transferred, then the amount of money available from that sale to go to ordinary shareholders like me and you decreases. Which brings me nicely to the penultimate point from the Q&A session, and that's the future of the Zulu plant, or more importantly, George's vision for the future of the Zulu plant. And there was a reasonable discussion about expanding the Zulu plant, adding to the flotation plant, bringing this DMS capability, expanding the EPO, so on and so on. However, I think that until the first shipment is made from Zulu plant, a lot of this discussion is largely irrelevant. Don't get me wrong, having a vision is really important, and it's great to have it on a bit of paper somewhere in the bottom drawer, ready to be pulled out as soon as production is achieved. But the most important thing is getting that first shipment out to CAMAX. Everything else then should follow from there. However, George did say one other thing, and this was really important in my view. He stated that although there was never any strategy to get Zulu up to production and then sell it, it would be a miss of him to not consider reasonable offers for Zulu should they come in post-production is achieved. And of course, any offers would have to go to a shareholder vote. Now, does this mean that he's had offers? Does it mean that people have already shown an interest? Well, for me, I don't think so at this point in time. However, what I think George did do, he made it very clear in an open forum that he is open to offers. And therefore, if any of you out there are interested in looking at Prem and potentially making a bid, then go and knock on his door. That is basically what he's saying. 
And this adds a real a new dynamic to the next few months for Prem that could be really interesting for new and old shareholders alike. And the final point that George discussed in the Q&A session was his own future in Prem. There's obviously a number of questions that have come through. And to be fair, I raised one myself about his future, how long he was going to stay with Prem and when a successor was going to be appointed. And I have to say, George sort of contradicted himself here. He basically said he was going nowhere in the near future, but he would be also very open to someone coming on board and taking over if it was the right individual. What George didn't state, and this is what I asked, is what was the status of the request to the board that was made last year to find a successor to him? This was made, I believe, sometime in early Q4 of last year. It was stated in one of the mining events in London. And George, unfortunately, didn't provide any update on this. Okay, that's sort of it for the interview. And as I said to you before, the interview was long. Um, There's possibility that I've missed a few points in there. I think I've covered most of the salient points. Uh, if I have missed anything and you've got any questions, just add it to the comments of this video. Uh, but I think I covered main, the main points. If you do want to watch the, uh, the uh, Q&A session itself and you haven't seen it, I did publish it myself. I'll remove it if Prem actually published it. But if you want to find it, you'll find it on the BizTech channel. I'll also put a link to it in the description to this video. Okay, so the final question is, of course, what will happen to the share price on Tuesday? When the market opens, what will be the impact of this particular Q&A session? Well, for me, I think there's going to be an inevitable bit of fun on Tuesday morning with the market makers trying to play with a bit of volatility and make a bit of money. But as we go through the rest of Tuesday and potentially um, into the rest of the week, I see the share price settling down again and potentially coming back or recovering any potential drop it had early on Tuesday to get to sort of where it is today. And the reason I say that is although there was negative news about the shipment in March and the production in March, one could argue that this is actually priced in already. I certainly think the expectation for me was that there was going to be no shipment. It wasn't a surprise and this was stated by George. And I would say the market has probably taken most of that on board already in the previous couple of weeks. And in addition to this, there was some positive new news coming out. We've already discussed Matari. We've discussed about a potential sale of Zulu being mooted around at this point in time. And these are positive things for the share price of Prem. And these may well start to be taken on board, especially if we get uh, an RS sometime this week about Matari being moved forward. It's also clear to me that Prem have got a far greater handle on the issues that the plant is facing at the moment than it did two or three weeks ago when Stark was still on board. And this has got to be seen as relatively positive. Remember, the markets price things in in the future. And what's happening here is that Prem is now seeing the issues and they're trying to resolve them. And that means that at some stage or other, they will resolve them and the plant will start producing more. I'd also reference the AGM as well. The AGM is scheduled for a week on Monday on the 8th of April. Now, of course, no one knows the outcome of the vote yet. In fact, I'm sure that many people have not even voted yet. Uh, but I'm also sure that as we get to the end of the vote, we will find that more people have voted for Resolution 2, the funding of the share issue resolution, if you like, uh, than against it. Now, whether these vote hit the 75% majority that is required to pass the resolution, we will see on the 8th. However, if it does, then what will happen is, yes, there will be an inevitability of dilution, but there will also be a lot of uncertainty removed from the markets regarding funding for Prem, and people will know that Prem is going to continue for the coming months, and probably then up until it does get production and possibly become profitable. And of course, once production does start, as George has stated and I've already stated in this video, the banks will open the doors and funding facilities should be made available to Prem. And if this is the case, then the likelihood of additional share raises for working capital purposes will decrease and the markets will start to price this in. Now, for me, I have quite a large holding in Premier African Minerals, far larger than a lot of people who select me off on social media think I have. And I, for one, would love to be able to go up to George, stick my finger up to him and say, no, I'm not going to vote for Resolution 2. I'm not going to vote for another dilution. Go and find another way. However, if I did that, I personally think I would be cutting my nose off to spite my face. Don't get me wrong, I hate the position we're in. I think George's management and George's leadership has driven the position we're in, and I'd be the first to vote yes if there was a vote for a change in leadership. However, I have voted yes for both of these resolutions because I think they're the best options at this particular point in time. I don't think they're great options, don't get me wrong, but I think they're the best options and the lowest risk options to get us to production in the quickest time. Of course, me voting for these resolutions doesn't mean in any way that you should vote for these resolutions. You should do what you think is right. That's the only thing you can do. Okay, that's it. I hope you enjoyed this video. It's quite a long one today, but it was quite a long Q&A and quite a lot to go through. Um, if you have any comments or questions, obviously add them to the comments section to this video. But in the meantime, please give us a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel. And of course, thanks ever so much for watching, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye.